date. During the last couple of days, we have heard a lot about DMO strategies. We have heard a lot about over-tourism concepts like that. We have also heard we need new uh, criteria, and perhaps our next speaker can help us here. Dr. Paul Rogers is one of Asia Pacific's most experienced tourism experts, tourism experts when it comes to tourism as a factor for development. In 97, he completed his PhD studies on tourism, conservation, and development issues in Nepal. He's been a long-term um, consultant for the UN Nation Tourism Organization, and he's been working with a lot of other international organizations. His work has been mainly in Nepal, Bhutan, Laos, Greater Mekong, and Myanmar. North Korea, that's a very interesting one, that would be another live session for all, I guess, um, and West Africa and Australia. Now, the reason Paul is here today is he is a co-founder of Planet Happiness, a non-profit organization which is trying to measure the happiness of residents living in World Heritage Site. Paul, I am very curious and anxious to hear what you can tell us. The word is yours, please. Thanks very much, Yen, for that kind introduction, and uh, very many thanks for inviting me to be a keynote speaker at this excellent and, and groundbreaking event. Uh, hello, everybody, uh, wherever you may be in the world. I hope you're all well and enjoying the fruits of this wonderful online conference. Um, I'd like to share my screen for the presentation. Uh, technical support, can you help me with that, please? There we go. I uh, hope that's up in front of everybody. And I'd like to welcome you uh, to this Planet Happiness presentation. Uh, Planet Happiness is a tourism and big data project that measures the happiness and well being of residents living in World Heritage sites. Now, following the onset and the devastating impacts of the COVID pandemic on all our well being, and as our planet happiness inclusive approach to destination planning is relevant to any tourism site, we're pleased to be able to expand our offer and deliver five key benefits to destinations interested to partner with us to build COVID resilience and recovery. These five benefits include firstly being a world leader. Uh, positioning your destination as innovative and groundbreaking by applying a well-being approach to building COVID resilience and recovery. Secondly, developing a marketing narrative, using our approach to develop media stories and a, a wider branding strategy. Thirdly, we focus on engaging residents and industry stakeholders to develop these well-being focused interventions. Fourth, we support destinations to position themselves as high quality places to live and visit. And I'm sure you'd all agree that the adage, a great place to live is a great place to visit, has never been more relevant than it is today. Fifthly, we invite you to use our wellbeing data to build trust, alignment and synergies between tourism stakeholders and residents. And this also means developing policies to improve the residents' quality of life, provide higher quality visitor experiences, and build resilience against future waves, any future waves of the COVID pandemic. It, and collectively, therefore, this helps to identify and implement recovery strategies, tourism recovery strategies and actions. So how are we able to deliver these benefits? Well, let me work backwards from here to explain how we do this. Planet Happiness is a project of the Happiness Alliance, a globally respected nonprofit providing tools and resources since 2010 to support individuals, communities, governments and other stakeholders uh, um, to engage with the happiness and well-being agenda. We're invited participants of the UAE's World Government Summits and OECD forums on measuring well-being, for example. So the key takeaway from this slide that perhaps many of you may not be aware of is that happiness and well-being can be defined and measured 
and that these measurements are integrally linked to happiness and well-being science, policy and practice that is increasingly being taken up by enlightened governments around the world. Besides the UAE, think of Bhutan, the birthplace of gross national happiness, New Zealand, Iceland, for example, and I should also mention that all EU states are engaged in different forms of happiness measurement and policy making. If you want to know more uh, about this agenda, please visit the Happiness Alliance website at the bottom there, happycounts.org, and perhaps buy a copy of the book you can see there, the Happiness Policy Handbook, which explains the different policies and practices that governments around the world are currently employing to advance this agenda. So Planet Happiness was formed in August 2018 to support two elements, let's say. Firstly, a more inclusive approach to destination planning to promote responsible tourism and avoid or better manage uh, over tourism related issues and to support growing global interest in this fascinating, intriguing uh, hap happiness and well-being agenda. Now, on the subject of inclusive tourism planning, over the last 20 years, I've supported the preparation of more destination management plans than I can remember. And many of you all know that this is a relatively straightforward process that involves engaging with many different government departments, not just tourism, but transport, environment, culture, for example, uh, the private sector through the various subsector associations and through innovators uh, in the sector. But it's a little bit more complex and challenging to engage local residents. But this is a very necessary and important process, especially if you believe that tourism should be developed to deliver not just local employment and uh, income generation, but also celebrate local culture, indigenous communities, and to protect and conserve local ecosystems and biodiversity. So our Planet Happiness approach is focused on get addressing this gap and this lack of inclusivity as far as destination hosts and residents are concerned. So how do we do this? Well, we use a Happiness Alliance tool called the Happiness Index Survey, which is a 15 minute online survey, currently available in 24 different languages, and it's an OECD recognized best practice approach to measuring individual and destination well-being. From the survey, we produce personalized one-page scorecards across 11 well-being domains that allow every survey taker and each destination to directly engage with the happiness and well-being agenda. Nine of these domains in black you can see there align with Bhutan's approach, the pioneers of subjective, subjectively measuring well-being. Uh, two additional measures, satisfaction with life, were added to align with international best practice of well-being measurement. We've also added a range of, well, around six questions uh, to gauge resident satisfaction with the way tourism is developing in the destination. And these particular questions are centered around the contribution of tourism to local and sustainable development. And these are aligned, the questions are aligned with the way that tourism is featured in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So just as we have individual uh, personal scorecards, we can create destination scorecards from the collective result. So on the left here, you see a destination scorecard with the residents results in gold compared to all other survey takers in gray. And you can see from that one page scorecard that it gives the impression that the residents are happier than most survey takers. So that may spark in, uh, conversations between different groups or individuals on why that might be the case. Now, from a tourism planning perspective, this gets more interesting to me if you remove the comparison with everybody else and stack the scores from low to high. And in this example, we can see that the highest scores are uh, clustered around uh, psychological well-being and satisfaction with the environment and life. But their lowest around access to lifelong learning the arts and culture, 
work leisure time balance and sense of community. So if tourism is a vehicle for development, as we all know it is, we can ask, well, what can tourism do? What activities, what interventions are needed to be implemented, designed by the local communities and implemented to strengthen these deficiencies down the, the lower end here? <clears throat> now, while these uh, one-page scorecards are great at sparking conversations about individual and destination well-being, they're backed up by more substantive, in-depth reports that come from the data that we harvest from the surveys. And these reports are link, link the survey results with tourism development issues that need to be addressed and managed by the destination. So the scorecards and these more in-depth result cards are used as a bridge for dialogue to build trust and alignment at synergies between residents, governments, and the private sector. And the stakeholders can work together to develop tourism responsibly by supporting actions that are proposed by local residents to strengthen destination well-being. And across destinations, we can create ranking profiles and we can showcase what destinations are happy and why in which areas and uh, spark conversations to carry this agenda forward. Now, a little bit more on our process and how we work with destinations. We have a 10-step approach. We work primarily with destination management organizations to engage a broad mix of stakeholders who assume ownership of the process. And we will deliver as much or as little backstopping support as may be needed to carry the process forward. Now the how page of the Planet Happiness website goes into a bit more detail on each of these steps. It's just a 10 minute introductory read and it covers this in more detail than I have time for today. But to say briefly, we assign each destination with its own unique URL that allows additional questions specific to that destination to be added if needed. And following some detailed planning and capacity building on our part with the destination, the survey is deployed uh, largely online, but perhaps also through enumerators if needed. And at step six, the data is analyzed, the reports are produced, and then these results are presented back to the residents and stakeholders for residents and resident groups to take the lead in determining the interventions that are needed to strengthen well-being, and that these are implemented alongside any other activities that are typically implemented uh, through a destination planning process. So this isn't rocket science, right? As you can see, it's fairly straightforward, it's cost-effective, and it's an intuitive approach that aims to meet and bring together the needs of all stakeholders. Now, given the linkages between the happiness agenda and the UN Sustainable Development Goals, World Bank colleagues that we're in conversation with and many other, uh, stake, uh, many other um, planners uh, interested in this approach, they recognize that this data-rich approach enables measurement towards sustainability and towards achieving the SDGs on a, on a destination level. And of course, it also engages different stakeholders in, a, in an active conversation about sustainability. So where are, we, where are we at the moment? Well, since we started the project, uh, we began with four, four sites, four World Heritage Sites. We now have 17 up and running at various stages of development, progress, um, and we have conversations starting, new conversations starting on a week-by-week -week basis. Uh, last week, we signed an agreement with the uh, Department of Tourism in Vanuatu support, to support their COVID recovery process. We have many other conversations that we'll be able to share with you uh, as this project uh, moves forward. We also have a partnership. Our first partnership agreement was with PATA. Uh, we also have an agreement with GSTC. Now, this is interesting insofar as the GSTC's uh, destination criteria, it regularly refers to where tourism should be developed to support destination well-being. But I think a lot of us a lot of people are in the position of not really understanding what, what well-being is. Well, as I've mentioned, we help to define it, we help to measure it, and we help to measure movements towards strengthening well-being. 
We also have a, a partnership agreement with the World Tourism uh, and Culture and Heritage uh, Association. Uh, Chris Flynn, he's presenting as part of this, uh, this uh, excellent conference. Uh, we have another agreement with the UNWTO Affiliated Center for Excellence and Development. We also have partnerships with a range of universities that want to engage their students in conversations about sustainability, responsible tourism, and the happiness agenda. And their local universities are often able to play a role in deploying the survey and engaging with, uh, with stakeholders. So we look forward to embracing more partners and showcasing our work uh, through conferences, webinars, and, and various publications. Now, where are we heading moving forward? And I'm pleased to share with you that a couple of months ago, as a direct result of the COVID pandemic, we have been approached by a global corporate, a very large corporate, leading in the application of artificial intelligence systems. And they're keen to work with us to support COVID recovery processes. So we're imagining interfaces that connect the different uh, stakeholders together. So you can imagine perhaps that a, a phone, a survey taker could take the, you know, the survey on their, on their phone and then uh, engage with an app that helps them to interpret and uh, use that, that data. And those uh, systems can be connected to multi-facing dashboards that different government departments would have to allow them to engage with that data, uh, develop uh, forecasting capabilities of the impacts of different interventions. So the results of this process would be more uh, demonstrable benefits for the different stakeholders, for, for destinations. Now to talk about that in just a little bit more detail, the survey takers can choose, we are imagining, to either keep their data personalized and to themselves on their, on their phone, or they may wish uh, to engage with governments or N NGOs uh, to create, to co-collaborate and create what we're calling citizen science wellbeing projects. So the government uh, multi-facing dashboards would, I've mentioned the forecasting capability, for example, they would also uh, be able to use the data coming in to engage with communities to create these collaborative interventions. So an example here uh, might be if we think of um, Wikipedia and the different pages in Wikipedia, they are formulated, as we all know, through co-collaboration. So in, in a similar way, stakeholders could co-collaborate the design of different types of interventions to support the, the, the agenda that we're, we're talking about. Um, and um, AI is used to create Wikipedia pages, for example, and bots are used to, to help fill in the gaps and facilitate and enable the, the process. So what we're imagining is a, is a closer, uh, more well, more collaboration between the stakeholders, uh, well-being outcomes with shorter feedback loops, uh, trust being built between the different stakeholders, and greater transparency um, and, and visibility for the well-being um, agenda. Now, the very last slide I have here uh, tries to illustrate what that data pipeline is going to look like and how we would address uh, privacy concerns that people would have, which they have with the contact tracing at the moment. For example, we could develop a system that would work with contact tracing and give much more in return to those uh, users that are supplying their data to that are being interpreted by government, government departments. So all this will be set up to be GDPR data compliant. So I'm sure you will agree that's a, that's a fairly uh, interesting and compelling agenda, and it's going to be very interesting to see where we're able to take this moving, moving forward. So there we have it. Uh, that's an introduction to uh, Planet Happiness and how we're able uh, to work with destination partners uh, to deliver those five key COVID resilience and recovery benefits that I outlined at the beginning there. So uh, thanks very much. For, for listening and I'm um, happy to, to take um, any, any questions uh, 
uh, from you. Thank you. Now I need to delink my screen, do I? Um, <laughs> I'd like to delink de my screen, technical support. Thank there you so go. much, Paul. That was a very interesting overview. Um, and when I take account of all the discussions we've had the last couple of days, this is something actually practically which can be implemented pretty fast. As you said, it's not blocking scientists, but you can bring um, a lot forward pretty fast. Uh, if I may, let me allow the backbone of all this is this 15 minute survey you're doing, right? Is that I have quick three questions in relation to that. Um, do you have the same survey for a destination in northwestern Australia and in, in Bhutan or Nepal or North Korea? Would, would that be the same? That's point one. Point two, you take a 15 minute survey. Who do you choose? How do you choose the people whom you're going to interview who's go, going to make this survey? Normally, um, if you don't choose, you have a biased result because people who are mainly interested in this subject will be the one to do it voluntarily. And then point three in that relation, um, you do a survey, you have these, and I understand the result of this uh, survey is mainly an instrument for communication. And once you have communicated, you uh, expect the stakeholders to make action. Do you make a, an update? Do you measure the result after a certain period again? I don't know if you could comment on this, but yeah. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, so, firstly, then with the, the survey across sites. Um, yeah, the survey has been designed, uh, rigorously designed, ac reviewed by, through an academic uh, process to be applicable. Uh, across cultures and continents. So that in itself is, is quite an exciting prospect to start conversations about what, is, uh, what happiness means across cultures and continents. Um, but I also mentioned that each uh, destination gets its own uh, URL. So that gives us the ability to adjust one or two questions if they're not applicable to that, that destination and to design questions that are specific to the needs of that destination. So ideally, we do need to keep a, a solid core of questions to allow for that comparison, uh, you know, to make sure we're comparing apples with apples or, or around, the, around the world. Um, but having this flexibility to tailor uh, survey instruments to the needs of different destinations is obviously very important. And that's what we'll be doing in, in Vanuatu, for, for example. Now, on the, on the second question, who to interview, yeah, great. When, I first, um, when we first started to conceive of this project, the fact that the survey can be delivered online and that we have it, we had it to begin with in 17 languages and we quickly made partners uh, that were interested to translate it to their own um, you know, national needs. Um, and if we're going to deploy the survey online through stakeholder processes and conversations with tourism stakeholders and, uh, you know, particularly the private sector associations and employees and through local media, we can distribute the, the survey through Facebook groups, whatever it might be, in a very cost effective manner. And this would be a, a, a way to start the process in a, in a country, in a destination through convenience sampling. But for destinations that have uh, a more rigorous ambition, um, uh, they may choose to go about this through a random sampling approach. Um, and again, this is why it's handy to have local universities engaged, uh, because they can support that design of the random sampling approach, which governments need, you know, and need a, a more diligent approach um, to work with the data. So we have the flexibility to start small or start big according to the needs and the ambition of, uh, of each destination. And then coming to the third, uh, third question there, Jan, on the, uh, the redeployment of the survey. Yeah, you know, the idea is to design an intervention, carry out that intervention, and then remeasure uh, with a further iteration 
at some point in the future. And the, when that redeployment would take place can be decided by the, uh, the local partner. It might typically be each year, uh, but it, if there is a particular intervention that requires a, a smaller um, uh, time period, uh, then that can also be done through through support from local media uh, strategies, for example. Uh, but again, if destinations want to do this every other year um, and measure progress on a two yearly basis, then uh, then equally we can we can support that and deliver that according to the needs of the local um, local destination. I should say that our ambition is to cr increase the level of survey uptake each time the survey is deployed to make the planning process more inclusive and engage more stakeholders in the, you know, in this process moving forward. You can engage them in the discussions after the survey, or is this to deliver an instrument for communication, or do you then afterwards get engaged in saying, okay, these were the measurements, or these are the measurements we pre perhaps need to implement to, to get to better values? Yeah, okay. So, um, any destination planning process that I've been involved with over the last 20 years, in, in, it includes some form of consultation with local stakeholders. And they that may be broad town hall meetings. It may be focus groups, um, for example. So these results can be presented in small focus groups, in broad town hall meetings, um, with particular community organizations, with tourism associations, um, and the beauty of having these one-page scorecards is that they're very easy to communicate uh, either through social media or traditional media or through these groups. And I have to say that, that my colleague and co-founder, Laura Busikansky, the CEO of the, or the executive director, I should say, of the Happiness Alliance, she has this wonderful approach to developing colorful, engaging reports. They're not, you know, wordy scientific documents, they are practical, easy to engage reports that we can blend with a, with a typical tourism planning process um, to, to engage respondents, user groups, and bring them on side with this, this process and agenda moving forward. Um, it's a non-profit. You have, of course, have bills to pay as well. How is, it, how is the, your business model here? How is that working? Yeah, right. Thanks. Uh, good question. Well, as you can imagine, um, each destination is is different, and we, I'll be honest, we we don't have a, a one size fits all uh, amount uh, figure cost uh, for destinations. Uh, rather, uh, we I mentioned um, in the ten step process, we have an MOU, and in that MOU, uh, we include reference to an annual fee, a modest annual fee. It can be seen, if you like, as a, as a payment for the, for the URL. Um, I emphasize it's a modest amount. It's not a, um, a prescribed amount. It's a suggested amount. And there is a, you know, a conversation uh, around that time on, 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 on the payment for that particular uh, fee. Now, throughout that 10-step process, we deliver backstopping support as required particularly around the planning of the process, uh, training and capacity building to, to follow the, the 10 steps, and then in particular in relation to the, the writing up of the, uh, the reports that I, that I mentioned. Um, now, if local universities are engaged, you know, that may uh, adjust the need for the support from us. Our approach here is to empower local stakeholders and provide the support that they need at the pace they need to empower them and allow them to, to manage this process themselves, themselves moving forward. Um, so local ownership is, is key. It's a progressive uh, process. And we believe this is a more valuable process than each time a plan is prepared, you fly in some consultants who deliver something uh, without building too much capacity and you know fly, fly out again. So this is the, the model and approach that we're, that we're taking to this. Um, and we look forward to, to hearing from any potential clients to discuss these steps a little bit more carefully and work costs through with them according to their needs and, and, and available resources. 
mentioned in the beginning, you're working with World uh, Heritage Sites. Whom would you whom would you be interested in, in talking to going forward? Yeah, we we began the we began the project to focus on World Heritage Sites, not least because many of them are suffering from World Heritage, and we wanted to build this narrative about the importance of World Heritage and introduce global sustainability issues around world heritage, be it cultural or, or environmental biodiversity related factors. But following the COVID pandemic, uh, we can see that um, there is a very strong need in building resilience or bubbles that people are talking about. Building those bubbles is gonna mean engaging the variety of stakeholders in a very close dialogue to, to re-deliver the employment that, is, that has been lost. And so um, we're happy to uh, broaden the scope of our approach to embrace uh, demand uh, as, as it may appear. Um, and principally, we would like to hear from uh, destination governments, if you like, uh, but equally we can, uh, we, we work with universities, as I've mentioned, and uh, we're also keen to engage with with corporates of whatever whatever size that are taken by our approach, that like our approach, that see the logic and the sustainability of our approach. Um, and we're, we're keen to, to start dialogues there as well. At the end, you mentioned artificial intelligence. Um, two questions. The, the charm of your or approach today is that it's very simple. It's very simple yeah. to understand. It's very simple to implement. If you add artificial intelligence, that will look a bit different, won't it? That's question one. Question two is, how is, is your plan moving ahead? How does that work? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a great question, Jan. Um, and, uh, yeah, the AI agenda is, for me, it, you know, I, before this company approached us a couple of months ago, I didn't have a great deal of knowledge uh, about AI. Um, my colleague, Laura Musikansky, who I mentioned before, she actually sits on a, a global uh, committee looking at the ethics of the interface between happiness and well-being and artificial intelligence. Um, and actually, when you, when you look carefully at this, and I can share papers uh, on this, the artificial intelligence systems that we're looking to introduce here will facilitate and enable and make more interesting the process that we're talking about through allowing people to engage with the data on their phone, uh, exclusively on their phone without engaging with others, uh, can provide hints and suggestions on what they might do to build their own well-being. But equally, if, uh, if people want to engage in the citizen science projects, as I uh, mentioned, um, the dashboards that are being envisaged for, for governments will help uh, predictability in terms of forecasting for the impacts of dif dif different interventions um, and allowing for the co-creation of, of different projects, whatever, whatever they may be, according to local needs. So we're very excited about possibility for this. And if it, when it comes together, uh, the media attention that it will generate, both locally in the destination and uh, nationally and globally, uh, we think will facilitate uh, this, this process. Um, and we believe that this well-being agenda is going to be uh, have huge uh, and positive implications for global sustainability uh, to correct um, uh, some of the challenges, the crises that the planet is, is variously facing at the, at the moment. Um, so we have a, there are people working on these systems and processes at the moment. And uh, on, frankly speaking, the more interest we have from destinations to learn about what we're explaining here and to engage and create a demand for it, the quicker we will be able to uh, design and deliver these processes uh, because that will reassure the, the corporate that we're working with that there is a, a strong and positive demand uh, for these systems. Paul, this is so interesting. We are running a bit over time, but uh, um, anything you want to want to say before we need to, to shut up here? <laughs> uh, well, I'd just like to, to thank you and the audience uh, again for, for listening, Jan. Thanks for this wonderful opportunity. Um, 
And for those uh, that are interested, please visit our website um, and uh, follow up with me uh, via email. And uh, let's start the conversation and um, work with each other uh, to support the resilience and recovery processes that are needed to bring back the employment that has been lost uh, around the world and creating hardship uh, in so many countries. So thanks again. I look forward to hearing from people. Let me just uh, finish by saying I find this highly interesting. Um, as I said in the beginning, we have heard a lot about strategies, about the big words. This is a very simple way which can implement it, be implemented pretty easy, pretty fast, and not with a lot of cost, to start doing something action. And um, yeah. I wish you and I wish Planet Happiness a lot of success on this um, to the audience. Dr. Paul Rogers is available on our expo. You have a stand. Reach out to him. Um, I think this, this is something very interesting. Thank you a lot, Paul. Great. Nice one, Jan. Thanks again, everybody. Take care. Thank you.